Hey everyone, welcome to a screenwriter's rant, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm going to call my political videos, I don't know. I, I, I just felt like making a political video tonight. Um, and, and I'm not even sure this one's all that political, but it definitely has, you know, some interest in screenwriting. Oh, the dog is all wound up again. Come here, doggy. Do you want to be in the video? Are you just going to run around the room? Come here. I, it's really running around fast. Come here. All right. So, uh, you may have noticed that I've cleaned up the YouTube, the YouTube channel. So I got the videos organized at least. I, I don't know why it took me so long to figure it out. Uh, the controls are not very intuitive in my view. The editing controls seems to me that if you had a YouTube channel, that's like the first thing you would want to do is organize the videos under topics. So like, like other people have, and it, it, it's just kind of hard to find the exact controls. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot like the difference between PC and Apple. Apple's very intuitive. PC's just sort of like, here are 95 options. And you're only going to really use two, but you know, you have the other 93 if you ever need them. Anyhow, <laughs> about today's topic. Doggy, you really do. Thank you. Okay. Here, here is Joan. Uh, today's topic is why television, and to some extent movies, are fake. Uh, mostly we're talking TV. And the reason I'm making this video is people who work outside the industry, they don't really get just how fake, I think, television is. So when you see something on TV, it's not just slapped together like on YouTube, right? In YouTube, I've, I've pointed a camera, I can do whatever I want, I can put this up unedited with my dog running around in circles. That would never happen in, you know, a pro professional setting, not at ABC News, you know, I, nobody dressed like this without makeup would come on. It would all be perfect because that's what they strive for. They strive for that look and feel of whatever they're going for, right? So most, if not all of television is fake. And I'm not just talking about the narrative stuff. I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about shows like Dr. Phil, shows like, I'll give you an example. So there was a show one of the early precursors to this sort of Dr. Phil type show. Uh, it was called the Morton Downey Jr. Show, I think. I think that was the name of it. Anyhow, it was a big sort of loudmouth guy host who would have all these crazy guests and uh, they would talk about outrageous topics. I think it was on Channel 9, I want to say. And for a while, he was national news. He was also the guy, he faked um, a Nazi attack against himself, I think it was. You know, he went to an airport bathroom and like shaved part of his head and drew a swastika on himself or something like that. He was trying to, I think he was trying to get attention, if I'm remembering correctly, don't quote me. It was a while ago. Anyhow, long story short, I had a friend who was an actor, comedian. He was a guest on the show, but he wasn't a guest as himself. He went on the show I think at least three different times as three different people. Uh, once he was an effeminate body painter. Another time he was a director of a movie musical uh, about slasher movies, it was, it, or it was a slasher movie musical. And then I think the third time he was either like just an angry audience member or something like that. But he was three. He was an actor playing roles on a show that presented itself not as a narrative show. That show didn't present itself. Now, if you push came to shove, if you 
cornered the producers or sued them, like Alex Jones, when he went to court, Alex Jones, I believe, was forced to admit that what he does is a character. I'm pretty sure that had a similar thing happen to this guy, he would have been forced to admit that what he does is a character. The guests, not all the guests, but most of the guests were characters. And uh, they've been doing that for a long time. There was, there was an article years ago about people who, who go on these sort of reality talk shows. And there was a whole little network of people. And in fact, I had gotten a copy of this electronic newsletter and it was for people who wanted to be guests on the show. And you had to outline what your deal was and your contact info and then hopefully you would get a call. Because I was trying to get on as myself to promote my comics. Um, so what you have to understand is when you get these crazy guests who seem sincere um, for the most crazy things, often they're acting for money or attention. I was approached when I was doing the Jersey Devil comic, I was approached by, they were a producer for like a show, I want to say it was like TLC or one of those type of channels. They were doing a show about, you know, mythical creatures. And they wanted a panel of people to discuss it. So they called me up because my name had come across their desk somehow. And they said, we're doing a show on the Jersey Devil and we'd like you to come on the show. And I was like, yeah, great. I'm a, uh, you know, I'm sort of a local authority on the subject. I'd be happy to come on the show. And then the producer said something like, okay, but you believe in it, right? And I go, what do you mean? Well, you believe in the Jersey Devil. I go, well, I write a comic book based on the folk tale. I believe that the folk tale exists. If you're asking me if I believe there's a crazy monster running around the woods in, in South Jersey, no, no, I don't believe that. <laughs> and uh, she was this kind of like, oh, well, we'll get back to you, which of course they never did because what they wanted, and she pressed me quite a bit. That wasn't the length of the phone call. It was much longer than that. She kept pressing me because she wanted me to go on the show and say, I believe in the Jersey Devil and I believe there's a monster in the woods. I've seen it. You know, she wanted a crazy guest, um, you know, for her show for free. You know, it wasn't like she even offered me any money to lie, <laughs> which, you know, it would have been more of a decision, I guess, but I really didn't want to be known as the crazy guy who believes in the Jersey Devil uh, from some TV appearance. You know, and I had been on TV a couple of times for the Jersey Devil comic, never really had a good appearance, so there will not be a link in the description. Um, you know, and uh, TV people were very, you know, they're all about themselves, so one time, you know, I was pushing really hard to get something for the Jersey Devil, but I was also, I also had a job. I was a temp, and I was working at this nursery answering the phones. And uh, since it was a nursery and not a classic office setting, you know, you didn't have to be dressed like you were in an office. I was in a kind of a garage type setting where they were moving dirt around and, you know, and it was all guys and it was all workers. So, you know, it, it would have been, I didn't want to wear nice clothes to this job, so I didn't. <laughs> and often I would just show up. They didn't care if I was unshaven or anything. It was, on, in that level, it was a great job. I could just show up like a schlub and answer the phones all day. And I was basically there, long story short, to answer the phones because the owner uh, had a wife who was, uh, I think she was a little off, I'm not sure. But she kept calling him all day at the nursery and bothering him. So really, I was there as a buffer because she didn't like talking to strangers. So if I answered the phone, she'd just hang up. So I had that job. Well, the news people call while I'm at work and say, we want to do an interview with you. 
I'm like, great. Uh, you know, I'm free tomorrow or whatever. They go, no, 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 we want to do the interview now. And I'm like, well, I'm at work. Uh, it's a little inconvenient. Yeah, but we have to shoot it in the morning because then it's going to air an hour later. I'm like, is there any way? I, I said, I'm kind of not ready. I don't have any stuff. I, you know, I, I don't look great. No, 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 it'll be fine. Don't worry. So my boss, who was pretty understanding, let me do it. And they interviewed me in the driveway of the nursery. And I'm half asleep. I look like hell. <laughs> and really, it was just, it, it, it was just terrible. But the news guy, he just cranks out these local pieces. And that's what they do. And that's how little time they spend on it. So, you know, I'm not saying that all news people or... TV people are like this. Some of them are very professional, but a lot of them aren't. A lot of them are just working a job and they're just cutting corners and they're just trying to get to the end of the day. And understand that it's a very high pressure job. You know, if you whether you work on news or TV or whatever, you could be gone like that. The work is very ephemeral. It can end at any moment especially around the end of the season. So I have friends out in LA. One of them was working on a show. He was making good money. Uh, he, uh, he was writing, I believe he was writing cartoons. He was <clears throat> helping, um, helping to rewrite cartoon scripts that had been originally in Japanese. They'd been translated into English and then his job was to write them in you know, more conversational mode so the actors uh, would sound better. And he did that and he had a great job for a couple of years and then it just ended. And he didn't work for a while after that. So you have to understand what's at stake for these TV people, why they go to such lengths. Because if you're, if you're a regular working stiff, let's say, in the world of TV, you don't have any job security really. Unless you're in a union, you're like a teamster, even then, like shows end, that's it. You may get paid very well while you're working, but the moment the show's over, you're done. Um, so there's definitely a pressure to keep the show going at all costs because everybody's job is on the line. And if the show's not working, they're gonna cancel it. And you're all, everyone's gonna be out of work. Not just one person, the biggest person on your show, the producer, he's done too. And through other people, I know producers who, you know, they were living the high life at one point in LA and then the next minute they're done. <laughs> and there's a whole lifestyle connected to it too. And once you are unable to maintain that lifestyle, you know, it's very expensive. You've got a house in LA, you gotta be working or you gotta have some money. And um, there are some guys, they, you know, I have a friend uh, who was a, a movie executive in LA and then it was over. Couldn't maintain the lifestyle, had to go. Had to leave LA. It's very expensive. So I understand the mindset of these people, the desperation is there, which is why they'll say and do anything. They'll go to these incredible lengths but that's why TV is a lie. Because you as a viewer are very fickle. We all are. I'm not just saying you. And at a moment's notice, you're done. You're done with that show. Eh, I'm sick of this show. I used to watch the Orville. I watched the whole first season. I watched the first episode of the new season and that's it. I'm done. I haven't watched it since. And I. And I've sworn off the show. I'm not going to go back because I was so pissed off about the season opener in season two. And I was, on, I was on the fence about the Orville for most of the season. I was already complaining about it. But my point is, you know, I didn't know. I don't have any connection to any of the people who work on that show. But, you know, I'm sure they all have lives and families and they need that money. And some of those actors, I, you know. They, uh, they're, they're going to be out of work if that show's canceled. 
I mean, they're going to be done. So, but I don't have a personal connection to them. So, to me, it's just like picking out a can of peas. I, I, you know, I'm done with that show. But that show is going to do whatever it can to, to try to get me back in, to try to get as many viewers as it can. And if that means killing off characters or turning a whole show around, I mean, right now the show is very woke, as the Simpsons have gone woke. And, uh, you know, maybe that's appealing, maybe that's driving their ratings, but the moment it's not and they determine, hey, let's go the other way, let's be a little, like, uh, raunchy, let's be a, you know, non-PC, and if that starts driving the ratings, oh, they'll go right the other way in a second. Because that'll mean everybody keeps working. So there's no, you know... They say there's no atheist in foxholes. In Hollywood, there, there's no one with principles who's, who's going to work steadily, uh, I think, in a lot of cases. Uh, you know, because, you know, I mean, there are exceptions. I mean, Chris Evans is like, basically seems like he's leaving Captain America and his big time movie career so he could do political stuff. I think he's crazy. I think he was a great Captain America. I loved him in the role. I wish he would stay in the role. And I think people can separate your politics from the role, you know, and quite frankly, I felt like his Captain America, you know, while he wasn't a social justice warrior woke guy, he was, you know, very reasonable in his politics as Captain America uh, was for most of the run. You know, there was a, there was a point at which Captain America got a little now he's getting a little woke, they made him evil, uh, there's a whole thing, but you know, for a lot of the run in Captain America, it wasn't like he was some right-wing Republican guy, he was just super pa patriotic superhero guy. So I think people can separate those two and uh, you know, you can still do your political stuff, but you know, so I think it's a shame, I think it's our loss that he's you know, sort of going that way. But then again, I mean, a lot of actors, a lot of famous people do that. They get very famous, and then the thing that they're famous for, they get sick of it. I can understand it. I'm a creative person. I get sick of doing the same things over and over, and then, you know, I want to do something else. I mean, look at the Web Comic Factory. Look how many, look how many various <laughs> projects we've had over the years. I get tired of one, I go, I start doing something else, you know? But, I mean, that's the nature of creativity. I get it. But at the same time, you know, got to give the fans what they want. And it's not like he's not getting paid. But that's the other side of the coin. But the, but the main side, the side that's up more than often, is people who are just working. People who are just trying to keep their show going. And, you know, they're going to compromise. They're going to rationalize anything. If that means the producers on Dr. Phil are going to have to push their guest to do certain things or say certain things to make it a juicier, you know, soundbite, they will, I think. I don't have any proof of that, although I did hear that the, I think it was the black girl who claimed to want to be white and was very racist against white people. I had heard online that it was all fake. Whether or not the producers know that, I, if I had to guess, I would say the producers are totally aware of that. If not totally in on it. That would be my guess. They're not totally in on it. They definitely got pitched it and said yes, or they totally suspected. And they're not going to check. They're not journalists. <laughs> they're not there for news. They're there for ratings. They're there to keep Dr. Phil on the air for another year and another year and another year. Because that's work. That is sweet work and lots of money. And while you're making all that money, it's just stacking up. You know, hopefully you're not blowing it all. And uh, Dr. Phil's making money, so everybody's happy. You know, except people like me. I'm a downer. And I, <laughs> I for some crazy reason, like truth in my entertainment. So, you know, when you're watching something on TV and it's fake, a lot of times you don't know it. And that includes news. That includes reality, definitely includes reality shows. Most reality shows are extremely fake. I know this because I've, 
I haven't worked on them, but I have auditioned for some. And they hire writers. You know, it's it's about as real as wrestling. It's orchestrated. So wrestling isn't fake. There's definitely athleticism in it, but it is orchestrated. It's orchestrated to do certain things at certain moments. And that's reality TV. It's orchestrated. If it was real, it would be boring as hell. Or they would shoot, they'd have to shoot like five days worth of footage and spend God knows how long editing it. It's just the reality of life and random things that happen. And once in a while, yeah, something spontaneous happens and it's gold. Oh my God. The, the producers go bananas when something real happens and they can't promote it enough. Uh, because when it's spontaneous and it feels real, even if it's been or pushed or orchestrated just a little bit, man, they're going to push the hell out of that. And, and, and they even do that in movies, right? So when you're trying to get an actor's reaction, you may do it a few times and you may try to orchestrate, you know, just enough to get that one super genuine reaction. That's why they shoot so many takes, because sometimes it takes that many for an actor to really kind of go, oh. <laughs> in just the right way, they go, oh yeah, that's, that's the take. That's the take we're going to use. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people who are outside of the movie making and TV business, they don't understand. You know, you could go online, you could see CNN orchestrate this protest, I believe it was in the UK. Um, they had, I forget what they were protesting, but it was only about 10 people showed up to this protest. That's not much of a protest. So they situated them behind the camera in such a way that it looked kind of full. And, you know, they, they, they had a nice tight shot. And meanwhile, somebody else was there with a big wide shot to show there was only about 10 people there. And that really gives the wrong impression. So, you know, it's, I shouldn't say it's fine, but if you, if you are watching stupid reality TV like Jerry Springer or Maury Povich or, you know, I think all that stuff's stupid. If you're gonna watch that, uh, you know, it's not like they're making claims that it's real. They're certainly, in my view, heavily implying it, doggy. They're, they're certainly uh, heavily implying that it's real, which I think is unethical. Doggy. Um, you know, but the news does... Doggy. The news does it too. And... Come here, doggy. Come on. And then shut up. So, anyhow, the point of this video is... I'm going to have to beat up my dog. The point of this video is that um, you can't rely on the media because the media is so used to making everything fake. They're so used to constructing everything. The lines get blurred all the time. So there are producers who, you know, they worked on reality TV shows and they worked in news and they go back and forth. They're just producers. They're just cameramen. They're just directors. They're just cinematographers or whomever and they jump back and forth between whatever they need to do to make money if they're freelancers and you know is it is it is it an orchestration to put somebody in a good position next to a news guy and make sure the shot is good it's technically orchestration but it's one that we can accept because it doesn't mislead people. The, pro the, the, the Where it begins to break down is when people start to orchestrate stuff to get a specific reaction and mislead people. And that's what we're seeing too much of in the news, in reality shows, just in the media in general, even on these talk shows. The talk shows aren't reality shows, but they're supposed to be reality, but they're very orchestrated. Right, they feel like, oh, we're just talking off the cuff here and having a good time. Yes, it seems that way, but meanwhile, 
all, all those talking points have been discussed. The host knows exactly what they're going to, what, what, what things are going to be brought up. There's a rehearsal. Um, so it's not as spontaneous. It looks spontaneous. And uh, because of that, you know, for 90% of the shows, I, I think Letterman was a guy who, who played uh, uh, by a slightly different set of rules. He, he seemed to, and from what I understand, he would only see the guest, uh, you know, at the moment he interviewed them. Like he didn't see the guest ahead of time. Certainly his producers would and map out things the way Dave liked it. But, um, and I think, you know, there's some talk show hosts that still do that. They don't see the guest until they're actually interviewing the guest because that's more spontaneous. But some don't. Some meet them and say hi, and this is what we're going to talk about. So it's, but either way, it's still an orchestration for your benefit because ultimately TV and movies are a show. They're there to be, enter you're there to be entertained. The moment you're not entertained, you switch off the TV like I switched off the Orville. And if you're switching off the TV, they can't make money, everybody gets fired, and they all know that. So that's what it's, what's at stake when you watch TV. And it doesn't seem that way to you because, you know, if your favorite show or not favorite show gets canceled, tomorrow will be something else on. And that doesn't feel like anything to you, but what that means is a bunch of people got fired and a bunch of people got hired, and they're com probably completely different people. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a ton of money involved. When, when a newscaster retires or, you know, they get a new weather girl or whatever, that means somebody got fired. Somebody moved on to another TV station. Somebody quit. Sometimes people quit. Sometimes they get fired. Sometimes they retire. And uh, television is about looks and image and rate. And well, it's about one thing. It's about money. And what gets money is the ratings. And what gets ratings are good looking people and m meeting and exceeding the audience expectations. So everything's about that. Whether you're doing news, whether you're doing a narrative, or something in between. That's the way TV works. It's fake. So don't believe it. Do not trust TV. It cannot be trusted. YouTube, same thing. The only difference is YouTube, most YouTubers don't have the money, and uh, so they're gonna tend to be more truthful simply because deceiving you Eh, it's going to be slightly tougher, you know. You're going to have to be a good actor or you're going to have to orchestrate something. I mean, there are people on YouTube who deceive you, sure, surely. <laughs> and there are just people with dumb opinions or weird beliefs and they're pushing them on you. But what I'm saying to you is do not trust television at all. Question at all. Um... So if you're told something on television, whether it's a news, a talk show, a reality show, whatever, you have to take it with a grain of salt. All right, that's my rant. I hope it was interesting. Uh, I hope you like the new format of the YouTube channel. I'm also on BitChute and Daily Motion. Check me out at Patreon. Check me out at the Web Comic Factory and Super Frat. And... Uh, if you want to send me a tip, uh, you can tip me on BitChute. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. My name is Tony D. My dog's name is Joan. Joan Bark. And I will see you when I got another rant.